let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually have. Right. We have a this is mind. so we awesome. We are an open culture that it is actually in place. It is that process yeah. that a developer, or let's say, a as the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Hello, welcome everybody. This, this is, is the Ask and Open Shift admin. We are on episode 119. And we've got some, we've got a really awesome topic like uh, Brad and I have been working together uh, for a while now trying to get this scheduled. So I'm glad that we were finally able to do it. Um, Andrew might be here. Uh, he's not feeling very well. So, uh, you know, he, he said he was gonna try and tough it out, but we'll see if he was, uh, he, he's on a bunch of decongestants. So he might be, uh, he might be too far downstream to be able to uh, come in and help. Uh, so you know we'll we'll miss him if he's not, but you know we'll catch him up if uh, if that's the case. So um, before I get started with the top of mind, uh, just wanted to you know give Brad a chance to go ahead and, uh, and introduce yourself and the team. Yep, thank you very much, Johnny, and I hope uh, Soli's feeling better soon. And yes, thank you for having ACM Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes on episode 119. I know we've been here in the past with thir episodes 36 and 72, and so yeah, it's been a while. We're I'm very uh, Happy and proud to be here with my colleagues, Joy Deep Banerjee and, and Alex Kazos. And we're gonna present a few topics around capacity planning and performance and scale. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Joy Deep. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Joy Deep Banerjee. One of the senior architects in ACM, uh, deal with several things around observability, search, edge. And of course, what we will talk today about uh, uh, performance, capacity planning, and all that kind of stuff. And juggling with numbers. That's one of my other hobbies. I really like to juggle with numbers, and we'll, we'll talk about some of them. Nice. Uh, and Alex is a big partner in our crime. So Alex, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. <clears throat> so I'm Alex Cross. Uh, I've been on the, uh, the Red Hat Performance and Scale team now for quite a while. Um, and my, my latest, uh, gig there has just been the, uh, telco 5g performance and scale. So I've had a lot of, uh, fun times here, uh, working with, uh, Joey deep and a lot of, a lot of the whole team, uh, just in finding various capacity planning or scaling issues and getting those solved. And, uh, it's just been a great time. So, yep. Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do some top of mind topics really quick, and then we will, we'll get right into it. Cause I know you guys got a lot to talk about. Um, so 3.10 for Quay went GA yesterday. Uh, we should see the docs updated pretty soon. Uh, but some of the big things that are coming out of that are uh, there's going to be an updated preview of the new UI that's coming out. Uh, there's going to be automatic cleanup of old images. So uh, a lot of that kind of, uh, you know, when, when you push images in, it'll help prune out some of the older stuff so that way you're kind of saving on storage. Uh, and then there's going to be an ability to disable robot accounts. Uh, for those enterprises that need to uh, have a, like a tighter control on who's got access to Quay. Uh, and finally, it's there's going to be support for IBM Z and Power. Uh, and then the next thing on our top of mind is we have uh, on December 6th, we're going to do OpenShift 4.14 for administrators. We didn't get to it before Thanksgiving, uh, so we're going to try and catch up to it and make sure that we get uh, you know a session that we're talking about all the new things that are coming out and uh, the hotness that are out there right now, so we can you know make hopefully make everybody's lives a little bit easier. And then on December thirteenth, we are going to have the trusted the trusted artifact signer team come on, and they're going to talk about how Red Hat is using Cosign and things from Sigstore uh, to make our supply chains and uh, software security that much stronger. So we've got a lot of good things coming up, and then. You know, like once we get rolling into the new year, like it's just gonna, we're gonna start all over, get right back at it and do some more awesome stuff. Um, so with all that, Brad, if you wanna kick it off and go yeah. bananas. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Johnny, Joy Deep and Alex, that was great. And yes, um, as, as we got to meet the folks that'll be uh, talking about those topics today, we're gonna focus again on uh, total cost of ownership, how ACM can help you reduce your total cost of ownership while extending scale we're really this, the ACM's an operator on top of OpenShift and we're that better together glue for many different systems. And you'll see that in the, um, is Joy, or is Alex cross shares his uh, lab work. We're focused on one particular use case, right? And, and that's in the Red Hat labs, but you'll see how many different components are brought together, whether it's the assisted installer. And that experience is the same if you're in the cloud 
or on the standalone um, installer or within the ACM. Uh, ACM's uh, the acronym we like to go by. And we have like five core pillars and, and you're going to see some of those referenced throughout the, the uh, call here today. Um, you'll see things like Talum or Talm, the Topology Wear Lifecycle Manager was is, is part of how we've been able to work with reducing total cost of ownership and extending the scale. And even the ability to call ACM has these uh, core pillars, let's say three of the five can reach out in a bi-directional way with Ansible Automation Platform, right? That's powerful when you're trying to stitch together an end-to-end -end solution with as much automation as possible. So we're going to cover some of those things. And, and ACM really is your Kubernetes guardrails for that desired state. You know, the, the cornerstone pillar would be your governance risk compliance engine. And that's how when Alex gets to his portion of the presentation, that's how we stamp out that desired state. And, and so we'll go a little bit into that. And uh, I think with that, I think we're ready to get going. We're going to start with Joy Deep here. You know, often we get asked about capacity planning and sizing. These kind of go hand in hand. And so Joy Deep has been working hard based on Alex's lab work. We've been able to see a capacity planning repo. And I've provided my email address in the chat because we'd love for folks to try this tool out and then send the feedback in, whether it's to my email there, bradman at redhat.com or through opening a case and just mentioning myself or Joy Deep, and, and uh, that's going to help us. Again, this initial seeding of this tool um, was based on Alex's work in the Red Hat Labs. Yep. So go ahead, uh, Joy Deep. I think it's, uh, let's go ahead and start work sharing on the uh, ACM inspector tool. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Brad. Yep. Uh, let's talk about how we started our journey. Uh, we started this journey when probably around end of 2021, when we were asked by uh, when we were when we were asked to take up a telco 5G case to see how many managed clusters or how many clusters could be managed by ACM Hub, the clusters having having a specific configuration. Uh, so Alex started uh, making the setup, and uh, uh, I remember. In, in the very first few days, we ended up blowing up its city. We were, you know, ACM hub couldn't handle, and, and I say this because, you know, we had the CD topic in the in the last Ask Me session. So we ended up blowing up its city, and that was largely because uh, we were doing, we were doing some things in the ACM, we were using operators, we were doing some things in the ACM, which we could have done better. This journey continued. This journey continued, and uh, ETCD made some improvements as well. But you know, when we started, we were about we could handle 250 managed clusters of a certain configuration, and today we are sitting at 3,500. That's the number. So we have moved from 250 to 3,500, and uh, uh, so it, it has been an extremely methodical approach. Uh, on how we went around it, how we went about it, look, looked at the numbers, made sure we are gathering the right numbers, analyzed it, open defects, and found out, you know, what what else we can optimize. Hey, how, why are we taking so much resources? Can we reduce it? Why are we creating so many, uh, let's say, secrets or leases or whatever? Can we reduce it, et cetera, et cetera? We went on working that way. So Alex's scale provided a very, very important his test provided a very, very important dimension, right? Now, provided one dimension. ACM hub sizing actually is extremely complex. There are many, many moving parameters, but uh, there is a system behind it. There's a method behind the madness by which we can, you know, make it simple. So uh, ACM is managing clusters. Are there anything in the clusters which impact the ACM hub resource consumption, ACM hub capacity? Yes and no. And that's what we plan to talk about. That's one, what we plan to break down a little bit. I have a drawing, but before, before we show the drawing, let me state verbally and then we will look at the drawing again. So there are different 
feature functions or pillars of ACM as Brad referred to. Uh, if we look at the security pillar or the governance risk compliance pillar, the GRC as we call it, if we look at the app lifecycle pillar, then these two do not really depend on how big these clusters that ACM is managing are. It just depends on how many of them there are and how many policies and applications we are deploying on them. So to give a concrete example, let's say uh, I have, let's say AC, I have an ACM hub and we, just for the sake of it, we have one cluster that the hub is managing. By the way, you'll ask, okay, why do we need an ACM to manage one cluster? Well, probably not with one, but the moment we start having two or three, I would say, buddy, get a hub. That mm. really helps tremendously to manage the, this thing if you, if you want to manage it in a systematic way. Now, so let's say you have one uh, cluster that's being managed. Let's say it's a SNO, single node open shift cluster, right? And we, we deploy. 13 policies, that's the number Alex put in our head yesterday. We deploy 13 policies and let's say we deploy 10 applications. The impact that will create on the hub, it will create an impact on the hub, right? The hub is managing this. So resources on this has to be reflected in the hub in some way. And how, how they are refle reflected for policies, applications and things like that, they are actually reflected in the API server HCD. Now let's take let's take a second case. Let's say instead of a SNO, I have a hundred node cluster, a gigantic cluster, but I also have the same 15, uh, 13 applications, uh, 13 policies and 15 applications of the same complexity. The, the impact it will have on the hub is exactly the same. It doesn't matter, right? So that's an important thing to understand for these things, right? And I, I uh, this is a loaded term. I said the complexity of the policies and the applications. You know, you can make a policy, ACM policy. Uh, it can be something very simple. It can be something very complex. So that does, you know, th those are the moving dimensions, many, many moving dimensions. And we don't claim that we have uh, conquered everything. You know, if you, if you have to uh, get measurements for each and every dimension movement, it's extremely expensive. When, when Alex shows his stuff, we will see how expensive it is even to run, expensive in terms of time, money, and you need to run it in a systematic fashion. It's not just, you just run it on, you know, so that you can harvest the data. So that's the, that's for the applications and the policies. Now, if we look at the other uh, pillars, which is search and observability, well, then they are more directly impacted by the cluster size. So if you have a single or open shift cluster, uh, we would assume that, you know, you can pack lesser number of Kubernetes resources, sigma of all Kubernetes resources, you know, namespaces, pods, secrets, config maps, CRs that you pack in SNO is certainly going to be lesser than what you can pack in a, a hundred node cluster, right? So. If we know now, if we know the number of resources that are being packed in, in the clusters, then actually I don't care about the size of the cluster anymore, right? So if I know the number of resources that are getting packed and likewise, so this is affecting our search, you know, using our search capability, we can actually allow you to find out the condition of any Kubernetes resource on any cluster in your fleet. So let's say you want to look at, um, uh, hey, what versions of uh, SRIOV operators do I have? Simple search and search can retrieve it. So search is looking at the sigma of all the resources, right? Of course, there are filters. You can say that I don't want so many and things like that. And the last portion is the metrics, the observability. There we do not depend on the number of resources, but we depend on the number of metrics that are being emitted. So if we know the metrics that are being emitted, then the size of the cluster doesn't matter, right? So having said this, let me share my screen and let me show a picture. Yeah, and, and one thing I'd like to say, to just to kind of add on to what you're saying too, right? And I, I think you made a really good point about like, 
you know, even though it's not, uh, you know, consuming the resources on the hub for like a, a policy and an application, right? It's going into it's, it's going into the API server via etcd. It's it's not. I, I think there's this misunderstanding when we we, we kind of sell things. It's like, oh, it's free, right? You do this, it's free. We don't really need to worry about it. And I think you're, you're making the point like it's 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 low cost. It's not free, right? But it, it it does cost something. And I think there's a lot of services that we have that people just assume like, oh, it just works, and I don't have to worry about anything. Like there's no blast radius, right? Like it just goes and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you called it out because it, it, it always takes something, right? It, it takes, it might not be much, but it, it takes a little bit to make it work. There is, so. there is no free, free stuff, right? Yeah. Especially when we are managing things, it has to store the state somewhere. There's, there's, right. you know, there's no magic here. Okay. Yep. Uh, right, let I'm going to turn your screen on. You can see the screen. You are good to go, sir. Okay. All right. So uh, let's, let's, let's reinforce this. Let's talk about this picture. So uh, just focus on a few things here. We are talking about ACM size, and we are talking about what things influence the ACM size. So the direction, it, the, the diagram is intentionally drawn that way. This is the direction it flows, right? So uh, we talked about the cluster size, and we talked about the cluster count. You know, We talked about how big your managed clusters are, whether it's a single node, or, or 100 node, and how many of those are there, right? Let's focus on the black dots. What we are saying is, effectively, uh, to, to paraphrase what I said is, if I know the number of applications and the number of policies that are running on each of these clusters, if I, if I were to know this, then actually I don't care about this anymore. All that I care about is number of applications and policies per cluster, and the cluster count. And these two will, uh, will uh, decide how many API server, uh, how many cube resources I'll create. The, the uh, controllers of AC create these resources on the cube API server. And as you can guess, they'll be, they'll be persistent in HCD. So, hey, each CD better be the the key things about each CD, which uh, you folks, if you some of you picked up the each CD session, uh, uh, the last session, uh, session one one eight, uh, then you would see that disk and network are primary key things. So, if these things are healthy, then at least as far as the policies are concerned, the two pillars of the, the application and the GRC pillar of ACM, they flow in this way, right? they will decide the ACM size. Now, let's talk about the observability. Again, if we know the time metrics count that, that we spoke about, if we know the metrics count that are emanating from the clusters, then actually the cluster size does not matter anymore. And you will ask, hey, how do I know the metrics count? We have a, a way to do that. We'll get to it in a moment. So if, if you know the metrics count, then the cluster size does not matter. However, it, it, what does matter is how many of those clusters are there. And then this goes to our uh, storage in Thanos, a, a, a regular distributed system, the ACM hub, and you know, and that, that drives the, uh, the observability health and the size. So you know, there's, very limited dealing with cube api server out there there's some bit but very limited it doesn't really you know uh, matter and let's look at this other black dot which we spoke about was for search where you can search for any resources across clusters again here the same thing if i am in the kubernetes resource count of each clusters then this cluster size doesn't matter right what what matters is how how many of these resources and likewise, this is a, a, a the search is a regular distributed system uh, has got little to do with the search on the ACM hub has little to do with the API server on the say, and that drives the size, right? And just in case you're wondering, yes, this is a causal diagram. This is not complete uh, intentionally, but this is a causal diagram. And there, there is a reason why we decided to do it this way. Uh, this will be improved upon. Uh, and uh, the the points that are shown here, we actually 
are collecting data for I think almost all of the points uh, using the AIM inspector tool that Brandon, which will go up in a in a few. So given this, uh, and and uh, uh, Johnny, keep me honest. If there are questions, etc., or if there's something I must repeat, just so given this, the question we often get what Brad said at the beginning is, hey, how do I size for, right? And it can come in different levels. So the first level it can come is, hey, I don't have anything running, right? Greenfield, I don't have any clusters that I want to manage. I don't have any ACM hub, give, give me a size. Okay, we will help you to get some size. The next thing could be that uh, I, I don't have any ACM, but the clusters that I would like to manage exists, right? The masters, they exist. I would like to put ACM now, these 10 clusters that I have or 100 clusters that I have, right? That's a very real life scenario. So for that, let's look at these black. We talked about uh, if you give us the Kubernetes resource count, or if you give us the time series, or if you give us the Number of apps and policies, I don't really care about cluster size, right? Okay, let's drill it down. If you have them, what we would do is advise you, request you to run the metrics extractor. I'm not going to run this, but you you folks can click on this. It's a very it's it's a simple Docker file that can be run. It look at the Prometheus of the of the uh, uh, cluster of the cluster you want to manage and extract the number of time series. So we will get this one, right? This, we will get what we would, what ACM observability would transmit out of the box. You can do plus minus, but you know, hey, we are estimating, we are giving a thumb idea of how much resources we would take, right? So this is this key piece of information, giving the time series count. Now, if you, if you don't have a cluster, again, you can go here, there's a notebook, ask you many more questions hey can you tell how many clusters you have how many work nodes would you have in average how many namespaces would you have in there which are non open shift uh, how many pods do you think would be running on these namespaces yada 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 so that from there we can infer the number of time series right but hey if you have the cluster we will get that count ready right and one of the benefits of doing this is if we have this count, then actually we can run some simulation on, at our end. Alex can run simulations at his end, you know, to, to see what the impact on the hub. And likewise for search, you know, you can, uh, if you have a cluster, this is a very simple bash script. Uh, if you uh, have a cluster, we, we can run this bash script to get the result. Again, that helps us in simulation, right? You ask, what about apps and policies? Hey, this is what we just need to have a feel. So uh, we can help you come up with a number. You know, depending on whether your, your telco or other kind of edge or whether you are a financial institution or you are retail, whatever, we can, we, we definitely have lots of metadata about how customers use us. So using that, we can help you arrive at a number. So knowing these three then, and knowing the clusters you can manage, we can do the calculation. And uh, the, uh, the other thing, let's go to the inspector. If you already have ACM running, this is again a real case, right? I already have ACM hub running, uh, managing some clusters. And the question that I might ask is, hey, is my hub maxing out? And you know, maxing out is not always in CPU and memory, right? There are other kinds of uh, limits you hit internally. So how is my, my hub doing? Is my amount maxing out, et cetera, et cetera. So there are several questions that can be answered using this inspector. Now, one of the things that we did is, so this is a Docker container. This is a Python script. We'll run it, um, which collects, uh, when and when you run this uh, uh, program, it looks it looks at the Prometheus of your hub cluster 
and it looks at the API server of your hub cluster and gathers decent amount of information and pumps it out, right? How does it pump out? It, uh, it pumps out, uh, you don't need to, you know, uh, it, pumps, it pumps out CSVs and PNGs and saves it, right? So for, for every draws, there's actually a back CSV as well, right? It creates about 50 or of such of these graphs. And, and then it tries to size the information so that you can get some meaning, right? And, and we will show that in a So that is what the inspector does. Now, the other key thing is when Alex is running his tests, he's also running the, the same inspector tool. So, you know, we are constantly um, uh, enhancing this tool uh, and, and it works both ways, right? So when, when as a customer, we run this, we get the data and we can compare with, take, take compare loosely, we can compare with what's in a scale element and then make conclusions, right? So uh, uh, this is the, the inspector has a lovely repo and uh, there are a couple of questions that rise automatically, you know, depending on uh, where, where you are. We already have must gather. Why do we need this? Well, there might be added to must gather. We are working through it, working through pros and cons. But the, the focus of must gather inspectors when inspector is trying to look at API server data and the metrics that are there in your hub Prometheus so that we can make decisions based on the metrics we collect. Okay, let, let me be careful. We make decisions based on the metrics as well as the data from the Cube API server that we collect. There are some critical information actually we collect from the Cube API server. But the goal is that helps us making some decisions. Today, the decision is still a manual process or or let me say we are trying to automate it. That automation is not yet exposed, but this is where we want to go, right? The idea is not really to dump those 50 CSVs in a, in a Grafana dashboard or whatever dashboard and tell, hey, Mr. Customer, go and swim. Go and drown yourself in the river. You can do that if you want, but that doesn't really help, does it? You're trying to get a question answered. We better answer the question directly, and that's where we want to go. And the other thing is, you know, uh, is this related to SLOs in some shape or form? Yes, this is related to SLOs in some shape or form. So we definitely would be uh, taking the metrics that drive the SLOs in the inspector. We would do that, right? Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff to contribute. So if you guys are interested, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff to contribute. And the inspector, you will see exactly the same drawing. It might differ a little bit, but now, now, this stuff is driving the ACM health, right? Having said that, let's let's look at a demo of this. So I am logged into a cluster, uh, and I, I had a I did a run earlier. So I'm logged into a cluster, and um, ACM inspector, uh, source supervisor, uh, and I will just run this program. Okay, I just run this program. What this will do is now all of this is getting saved. Um, I, I already have a directory, but this is this is running, and what you're getting in the screen is the current uh, current response. So if you look at the code, you will see that it's organized in two different ways. One is what's happening now, and the other one is the historical data that you have in Prometheus, right? And uh, the historical data, what's happening now is coming on the screen. The historical data that's there in Prometheus is actually getting saved in those CSVs and PNGs that we just looked at, right? And the reason we CSVs as well is, hey, PNG is taking one view of the data. You might still like to have access to the raw data so that you can do other kinds of analysis, right? So, uh, uh, so it's there. Uh, the color coding ignored it. It was just me trying to play with colors to see if I can, if it can be made pretty. And, and uh, 
for example, look at this ITCD. So this is these are actually taken from the ITCD team. If you look at ITCD's knowledge base and things like that, they ask they ask uh, you know whenever you ask for ITCD help, they ask you to run certain metrics, certain tests. We try to incorporate them, right? We are also trying to see if the if how many resources are created in the Cube API server, are they getting hammered and stuff just like that. And we also look at the CPU utilization of the, the ITCD pods, the API server pods, if you're running Argo CD and stuff like that, those pods, as well as the ACM pods, right? So we are looking at the whole picture holistically so that at the end of the day, you know, someone by looking at this data can conclude, hey, is my, has my cluster any more room to grow? And, and associated different questions, right? Hey, Jordi, real, real quick. So how, how often would you recommend running this? Because I, I see this, like, just, just from, like, this obviously been my first time looking at this, right? Like, I can see this being extremely useful for SREs, platform engineers, and stuff like that, right? So, like, how often, is this something that you'd run daily and just, and, and coalesce the data and then maybe, like, you know, look at, the, you know, you'll, I know you're going to show the chart in the PNG, but, like, maybe compare the charts on a daily basis or weekly basis or, like, like how, how what do you see this being used, or how often do you see this being used for? That's actually a fantastic question. You know, so uh, let me try to answer it. Uh, so you're running this on a running a hub, right? Mm -hmm. So there are two drastic kind of scenarios. You might have on on uh, this hub, for example, that we are running. You will probably see that the number of clusters that have been managed is constant over the last seven days. Uh, and so if and and they are they are constant they are not really changing let's say your prometheus has seven days of data so uh, uh when you run you expect the number of clusters to be the same because you're not adding any clusters so you would expect the pattern of one run versus the other run to be relatively safe right mm -hmm. and so then at that point uh well now this is being run but you know, I'm looking at a future state, uh, John, and not discussing with any of the PMs, just a technical nerd. I, I see this ultimately being run drip feed continuously in the ground to detect changes, if any. Mm -hmm. That's right. But otherwise, uh, I'd say running once a week should be good enough. Yeah, because I, I, I can kind of see it like, um, almost as a checks and balances tool, and checks then and, at, and at the right. same time, right when it's like, hey, I want to onboard a new cut, may, maybe I've got a new customer coming on, uh, and they've got applications, or maybe they went their own cluster, or whatever, the, whatever their requirement is, right? Then this could be a tool to say, okay, well, can I even take on that capacity, right? Or right. do I even have the capacity to take on right. that that cluster or, or application or whatever? So right. I can see it definitely being. It, it's like the, uh, uh, the the Gerber, right? It's a multi tool. Yep. 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 Yeah. Exactly. Very nice. And, and by the way, this error is actually not an error. As we talked about, ACM has many features. In this mm -hmm. cluster, ACM observability all, so it cannot get to these data points. So yeah, so it throws out the error just in case uh, if this. Error, but in fact, observability is not installed on this cluster, so we don't see this data point. Now it has generated that that copious amount of uh, directory that that I just showed. I'm cheating slightly. I. Uh, by the way, this what we did is generated right now. So if we go to, you will indeed see that this is being generated now, 32 today, right? So this this is this is indeed being generated. Uh, why I'm saying I'm cheating is I took a run from another cluster last at 6 6 17 Pacific, which has a much richer data set, right? So just want to give a, a few glimpses of what we can. Uh, but I, I'll first jump to the question that you asked related to the question. You know, so we are just not gathering the data. There is a step that we are taking. We are in the key data points in a CSV. And for those whom, whom of you are machine learning fans uh, or have got to do a little bit of data science, you'll realize that this is the first thing you, you have to do this is driven by domain knowledge before you can start to do analysis. So what do we do? We take all the 
So this is timestamp from 11.23, I, I mean, uh, from 22nd November till yesterday. So this Prometheus web data till yesterday, right? Uh, eight, and it is telling us, hey, for each of these uh, intervals, the one minute interval, uh, how many managed clusters did we have going back again uh, to what I was talking about, Johnny, to your question? This mm -hmm. is generally static. It, it is 14, and then there were some which are, uh, I think at some point it went to 13, and then it came back to 14 again. There are some duplicate columns, but it is it is gathering how many time, time series are we sending. Remember, we talked about the time series size. What is the each series size? Uh, what is the size and size in use? There are two sizes. Hey, how many leader elections have I been having? Right, that shows whether each city is um, uh, unsteady or whatever. Right, what is the back end commit duration? Once again, each city recommended things: wall sync, network, I/O. What is my cluster capacity? CPU. Hunting. How much am I using for Cube API server? How much am I using for ACM core? How much am I using for non-ACM function? Right? Yada, yada, yada. We take mm -hmm. all of this in a CSV. It's work to be done. There is work done in the program to get the data in this format, right? So now, Johnny, there is some unpublished stuff that we are working, which is to take this data and analyze it automatically. As a human being, you can analyze. Now, if I give you the CSV, uh, well, there, there are some PNGs uh, drawn as well. Like, for example, this is showing the, the CPU utilization of the master node. OK? So there are some helps drawn. But if I give you the CSV, then you as a human being using Excel can draw graphs and charts and figure out what's going on, right? But we want to do, we want to codify this process so that we can automatically give you, throw you some recommendations. We are working on that, right? That's awesome. And the and other thing is the calculator uh, future item, right? Yes. Right, right. And the other thing you realize is this, the very fact, the columns that we are choosing, that is heavily ACM domain knowledge. Mm -hmm. ACM domain knowledge is deeply used hence this drawing this is acm domain knowledge i'm not trying to infer that from the data i'm trying to use that domain knowledge which drives how the data is being generated by the physical system right and alex is in those uh, alex has a sub where he's running those tests and he is generating the data right uh, out of all the variables we talked about you know uh, so in Alex's test, he has a certain, uh, he is varying the number of clusters that are running, but we don't talk about his cluster size anymore, but his number of policies that are running, uh, he, uh, and he has a fixed number of time series that are getting generated, and he has a fixed number of resource count. But if we would, you know, if we would ask, hey, can I have of policies? Sure, you can, but that's another new run. Can I change um, uh, the complexity of the policy? Sure, that's another variable. So there are lots of variables involved. But you know, to get started with, you know, we take that. Hey, let's assume that we take some ballpark policies, which which again comes from us dealing with customers. We don't know anything, Johnny. You're new to this, so you really don't know how your policies would look like. So we'll come up with an estimate of how this should look like, and we will give you some numbers based on that. Right. So that's that's, awesome. that's what it is. I love it. Right. It's it's you know if you've done any type of any type of capacity planning, it, it, you know in the past, right? It's it's been kind of a black box, right? And you're just kind of guessing, you know. And it's really best effort on on getting some of these things out there. So it's it's cool to have some data to actually back it up this time. But yes, you actually do need a cluster that's large for what you're trying to do because here, right? Not just because Johnny. Yeah, you know, I had an experience one time two years ago where some guy did something and you know it blew it up. So like you know now we're going off of that. Yeah, this is awesome. Yep, and that was the purpose of handing the repo out in the chat in my email. I would love to get more feedback to see that's uh, automation Joy Deep was referring to, where we want to uh, provide a codified version of this in the in the form of a sizing calculator. So please do um, take us up on that offer to share your data. 
yeah, it, it's kind of cool because you, you kind of get like with, with with the machine learning, like the future state, right? Machine learning and all that stuff. When you're taking those CSVs, and you're 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 learning from it, right? You start to get to the point where you start having like like the smart the smart infrastructure where it's like, okay, I've got I've got all this stuff coming out. Here's you know almost like uh, prompt engineering with like, okay, hey, look, you're you're running at at your threshold on this side. What do you, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to do you want to you know go left or go right? You know what I mean? Like, do you want to how do you want to grow this thing out? It's right. That seems pretty awesome. Like, I'm, I know that's probably not a thing, but I'm just my mind is. No, right you'll need us back when we talk about event driven architecture. Definitely, Johnny. We'll 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 talk more there with uh, that. That's absolutely where we're headed in the future. That's awesome. That is so awesome. That's exciting. Yeah, oh, man. Since, since you measured prompt engineering and stuff like that, you know the model that we that at least I want to use with this is a very similar kind uh, which won hey hang on hang on to your guardrails which won the nobel prize in economics in 2021 causality is in big time it's in mm -hmm. big time it's it's an evil word it's been not used much but causality uh, uh, from data is really big time so this is actually building towards the causal model we are getting there but Alex has plenty of stuff to show about yep. the thing that he runs because he is the primary person who is giving us that extremely rich data set. Let's jump to Alex's data if we if we're done with the uh, the capacity yep. repo. Yep. 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 Alex. Yeah. yeah sure. Um, if we could. Uh, yep. Here we go. Sure. There we go. Um, yeah. So I've been conducting ACM. Uh, essentially ZTP test is called. That's ZTP stands for zero touch provisioning. And uh, the focus there is uh, a telco workload. Um, so it's to manage many, uh, many managed clusters. Um, typically the workload has been SNOs or single node open shifts. Um, so I'm gonna share here what the environment looks like. Um, a little bit about the test orchestration. Um, and then I wanted to kind of highlight uh, maybe there's some other performance engineers out there that like to see this. Uh, just kind of the issues that are discovered at scale, and uh, you know what what, uh, what kind of things pop out of a test like this. So uh, the environment it's uh, IPv6. It's entirely disconnected. It's it's maintained inside of a, a lab that we have. Uh, so there's a scale lab that Red Hat has. Uh, it's been so. Uh, uh, been so thankful to uh, provide us with a lot of machines because um, at the end of the day, um, we wanted to scale. One of the requirements was to scale ACM above 3,000 clusters. And so one of the ways that we could validate managing 3,000 clusters is we need 3,000 clusters. Um, now, they declined my request to, to get 3,000 machines um, because that's very big and it's a lot of space and it's a lot... <laughs> a lot of money to buy 3000 machines. Uh, so we had to find out a better way to do it. So one of our ways to do this was to virtualize clusters. Um, but we needed clusters to behave as if they were real bare metal machines. Um, because for ZTP and Telco, these single node open shifts are going to be a real piece of hardware out there. And they're going to be provisioned when somebody goes and puts this machine in service, plugs the power on, ZTP is supposed to start provisioning that machine once it once it powers up. Um, so to simulate that, we were able to do that with around 140 or so machines, um, fairly beefy machines uh, in the lab. And so basically, if you look at this, uh, you look at this uh, diagram here. We have a Bastion machine that serves as our entry point to run the tests, and it runs a number of services, allows us to redeploy the hub cluster. Um, set up uh, the virtual machines as blank bare metal machines on top of those hypervisors. I say bare metal, but I really mean they're VMs. They're just emulating a BMC that allows that hub cluster to provision them. Um, so you can see here, <clears throat> it's all IPv6 uh, for the Bastion to talk to the hub cluster, for the hub cluster to talk to the, uh, the VMs that are hosted on the hypervisors. Uh, we also actually uh, add uh, latency uh, and packet loss to those hypervisors. So that way, those uh, the hypervisor's NIC uh, that's bridged to where the VMs are. That way, um, those, VM, the, those VMs and those 
eventually managed clusters behave as if they're far away. Um, and that's the whole point with Telco. These machines are not all going to be next to each other. They're actually could be at cell sites. They could be rather far away from where this hub cluster is. Um, so the, the test orchestration is it has um, several phases. And one of the phases here is the deploy phase. So the deploy phase is we're going to deploy our single node open shifts. And we want to convert them into managed clusters. And then we want to apply something called the DU, which is distributed unit profile. Um, that's configuration that's applied via, uh, it, it leverages Talum that uses a cluster group upgrade, which uses, leverages ACM's policies to apply configuration to that end single node open shift. So hopefully, hopefully I didn't lose anybody along the line there with how many acronyms and, and how many things are chained together. Um, so the orchestration tool, uh, we didn't really know what this was going to look like for uh, what what a customer was going to do. How many how many single node open shifts are they going to create at, at one point in time? So I created this tool here where we could tell it uh, create a batch of X number of clusters, and then I want to do that every uh, Y amount of time. So in the case that's visualized here, you can see it's a batch of 500. And it's every one hour. So if you look at that little artificial graph there, you could see 500 clusters are being told to be provisioned. And then I'm going to wait one hour afterwards. And then I'm going to do the next 500. And we're going to do that all the way until we get to that 3,000 plus. Um, on top of that, we might want to load it differently inside the Argo CD application. So there's some uh, tunings that we can kind of do there as well. Uh, at the end of this test, I want to know how many clusters were successfully created, how many became managed, how many had the DU profile applied, and then I want to calculate percentages across each of those those steps. And I want to know how you know how long did that take, and I want to know what my interval was. So I've developed this thing called the report card uh, that would just basically give me all that information, single page, flat text file, just let me know exactly what happened with the test um, because. If I'm telling 500 clusters every hour and I need to do 3,500 plus, already you're talking seven hours of just, just telling it, giving it 500 clusters to go create. So it's a very lengthy time period uh, for a test. Uh, so I, I, need, I want this to calculate all that for me. Um, and the tool does that. So now I'd like to highlight some issues that we discovered. So... Uh, probably the first uh, easiest one to kind of share here is on our journey to 3,500, um, which was originally it was just let's go to three let's go to above 3,000. We had a little extra capacity beyond the 3,000, a little bit beyond 3,500. So I pushed the the lab the full way, um, and this is this is actually back with ACM 2.7. So this is a little bit a little bit back a little bit backdated here. Uh, but you can see where I hit various issues. So um, generally, with the scale testing, I want to find the ceiling limit to something, and I don't want to find, I don't want to run out of hardware. I want to, I want to find the problems in the software, so that way I could bring that to the ACM development teams. They could, they could say, oh, this, this doesn't scale because this, uh, it consumes too much memory. We need to figure out what we're doing with memory here, and hone that back anytime especially with memory this is uh this this journey here was more about uh memory usage than anything um and it's it was mostly because if you consume more memory then you have to buy a bigger a bigger piece of hardware so that's going to cost more so we definitely want to focus on hey i want this to go to 3500 but not need as much resources um because then it could become cost prohibitive so so here you can see a couple ceilings in this graph that we hit and you can see the stepped approach of 500 every every hour and you can also see these lines represent uh different phases that the uh the the managed clusters or the you know as the cluster started from a blank vm all the way to a, becoming a open shift single node open shift cluster to becoming a managed cluster to becoming a du compliant cluster so you're kind of looking at each of those phases and you're also looking at to some degree that the, the ones that, how many are being applied or worked on at any one point in time down here on the bottom. 
So you can see SNO applied. That's basically, hey, I added them to my Git repo. Um, and now ZTP is going to expand a site config into a all of the custom resources in my hub cluster to turn that blank VM into an actual single node OpenShift. Hey, Alex, uh, real quick. I, I, I'm sure. sorry to, to interrupt you. I'm village idiot here. Uh, what does DU compliant mean? Uh, it means compliant with the distributed unit profile, which is okay. basically just configuration that's being applied to the, the single node OpenShift uh, so that it could serve as a distributed unit. Okay, awesome. And, Thank you. Well, that means and we so, added the yeah. document to the uh, chat that talks about this zero touch provisioning process along with the distributed profile that Alex is going over here. And and to take another step back, the, the DU profile is being done through ACM policies. That's how it links. So policy yep. is telling in the policy, we are telling that, hey, configure this cluster to have the PTP operator to have the SRIOV operator to have this citizen business. That's what's happening. Okay. Good. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so the basis is basically this, t this telco workload that we're running here is stressing more than one part of ACM the entire time. We're stressing the cluster life cycle of creating clusters. We're stressing, uh, the, Hey, a cluster becoming managed. So the import controller we're stressing there. Um, we're then stressing the ACM policy engine as clusters become online and now a cluster group upgrade object is created and it's creating enforced policies and causing uh, ACM's policy to enforce configuration. Some of that configuration is operators being installed. This is a disconnected environment, so it needs a new catalog source. It needs um, an image content source policy. So there's various configuration items that need to be put on those SNOs to make sure that it can, oh, now talk to this disconnected registry and install operators that are available there. And then on top of that, we need to configure those operators as well. Um, so with this graph, you can see here, well, it looks like we just stopped booting SNOs. We stopped discovering uh, you know, SNOs or, or uh, you know, in-process clusters that were going to be installed. And we just, you know, although I tried to install above 3,500, I didn't get there. Well, once we looked at it, we saw the OCM webhook that was OMing out of memory. So once I started crash looping, you could literally look through the data through there from, from Prometheus. Oh, I see this pod is crash looping. I look at, I describe the pod. I see, oh, it's out of memory. I look at how much memory it has. I'll look at Prometheus. I'll pull up Prometheus and see. Okay, I see this is when it started crash looping. This is when it started using too much memory. Um, and then I'll open up a BZ with that team. I'll talk to them. I'll get them on the cluster if they need to get a live analysis off of it. Um, and generally the goal there then is, okay, well, we can continue testing. What we can do is I can tune this pod to have more memory so I can keep testing while they develop a fix. However, the goal is to not bump the memory limit for that pod the goal is to hey let's figure out how it uses less memory because we don't want we want it to scale and have a lower cost um of hardware for your hub cluster there um and then you can see even though if we even if we did do that we can see the managed clusters it peeled off here it was following clusters that were becoming installed but then it, sl it started to slow down and it stopped it essentially slowed down to a, a crawl here. And that's because the managed cluster import control, that was having an OOM. So that ran out of, that was using too much memory. Open another bug with them, same thing. They'll, they went in there, fixed it. We could also tune the memory in the meantime. Um, and ultimately we want clusters to become DU compliant. So really we want this policy compliant line in the graph to go all, we really want that to go all the way to the top to 3,500. It couldn't because we could only apply the DU profile to managed clusters because that's where ACM's policy ended. So this was throttled back by that uh, managed cluster import controller. So once we fix those things, we do the next run. And you can see here, in this case, I've patched the memory for those two particular components that were OOMing. And now you can see, oh, now I can build clusters all the way up to 3,500. They become installed and they become managed. However, we hit a new ceiling. Now, uh, now we could see that the DU profile stopped right at around 2,000 clusters. So, started looking around. What's you know what could be preventing the DU profile? It uses you know ACM's policy engine. 
So we start looking at components there. Up, oh, we found another, you know, pretty obvious uh, contender. Whenever a pod is OMing, it's it's pretty obvious that likely that's that's the uh, the, the problem there. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at that pod. We'll look at its logs. We'll look at uh, you know, what its memory is set to, and then we'll contact that team. So now it's a, another team that owns the placement rules container. We'll bump that up, and we'll get to success there. So now you can see no more ceilings. And we're hitting, we're bringing, we're getting 3,500 plus clusters up to DU compliant up there all the way up to 3,500. Um, and you can see here a description of some of the things, some of the memory limits we bumped, um, how many clusters we got installed, uh, how many clusters became DU compliant. So here's the other thing. When you do something 3,000 something times, you're going to find those little 0.1%, those little 1% mm -hmm. bugs. Um, and that's what you see here. So you'll see while the line doesn't go exactly to the top there, well, what that is, is between that, that line to where we wanted to get to, those are all bugs. So <laughs> then it becomes, Hey, this is, I love just looking at the hub cluster, but now it's like, now I got to also look at, you know, my 3,500 SNOs and the ones that didn't quite make it all the way to becoming, you know, compliant. I need to figure out why they why they're busted. Um, so that's that becomes a new chore. We'll have to open bugs on that. We'll have to talk to those development teams. We'll use OpenShift's must gather or gather as much data. We'll try to root cause the bug if we can. We mm -hmm. found issues in, I mean, all across all across the board. Sometimes I'll find, hey, this etcd was degraded on this one. I might find the OLM. Uh, ran into a certain issue with applying the catalog source, and it only happens on a very few number of things. Maybe the MCO, or so we end up yeah. opening these tiny bugs. Um, the difficult part is these teams want to reproduce them. They don't want me to tell them, "Hey, you just need 140 machines, mm -hmm. run this giant test that takes 12 hours." And by the way, you might have one or two clusters randomly out of the 3,500 that have this problem. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's really like the finishing touch on, on trying to improve uh, the reliability of OpenShift's installation as well. And, but this is especially focused on single node OpenShifts too. So you may not see these, these type of issues with a standard or a compact cluster, compact being three nodes, standard being your typical three node, uh, three node control planes with three, three worker nodes. So one other one I wanted to highlight, if you guys don't have any questions or. So or one, one statement yeah. came up uh, from Dwayne was um, he, he said, I assume power consumption will also be a metric. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, uh, the, there, part of this, uh, the scale lab is actually the, the administrators of the lab have actually, they analyze the power of all the machines across the board. And they've uh, they've definitely found that like hey we can see the, these several racks of machines that is assigned to this testing is using more power than than these other machines. Um, so in, in this case, uh, we we would want to focus if we want to look at power usage, we'd want to focus on probably the hub cluster because the hypervisors are I'm I'm running as many SNOs as I can on those hypervisors, and that's not really what um, you know, a customer, that's not what's going to happen for a customer. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the, uh, the, uh, it's like, it's like a, I wish I kind of had a diagram that could say, like, show you the scale of like, okay, if you simulate a workload, like if we want the absolute find out all the bugs a customer is going to hit, then we would have 3,500 machines. We'd be testing to that level of test. Well, that requires 3,500 machines. That means the cost is going to be super high. So the cost yeah, is going to be super high. Yeah. yeah. So, with us simulating by having machines virtualized, we're saving on cost, and this is the level of simulation that we're comfortable with. If we were to if we were to go to a further level of simulation where, hey, now we're not using VMs and we're using mocked endpoints or something like that, we won't find we won't necessarily find these other bugs um, that a customer could run into. So, it's all about that scale of, you know what makes sense for how much you're going to spend versus the amount of hardware that's available versus uh, the amount of bugs you might kind of sift through. So, well, and, and you're getting reliable data, 
right? I mean, the fact that you found bugs in these containers and you were able to report those back and get them fixed and then rerun your tests and get, get the output that you were expecting, right? It just shows that the, the data that you've gotten out of this is reliable and something that you can take and, you know, take action on, right? Causality, right? I've got something now I can do right. something with it. So yeah, this is, yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Johnny, this is a closed loop. As Alex discovers mm -hmm. this, we say, okay, hey, why aren't we monitoring this? We need to monitor. That informs our causal diagram as well, right? It's 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 a fantastic closed loop control. And as uh, Brad already replied in the chat, uh, Red Hat as a whole for the edge is actually working towards uh, giving power consumption as a metric in the observability space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Using using Kepler, yep, it's, yeah, it's in the roadmap. We are working towards that. Yep, and Alex is the MVP at finding these things, right? Scale, uh, expressly extreme scale at this level. It you know tickles bugs and and um, hardware gets stressed to no, you know, to the limits. And and uh, you you know there's a mean time between hardware failure, and so you'll find that when you touch that many things, right? Yeah. And and so we do need to schedule coming back as we talk about whether it's event driven architecture joy deep's also part of you know we're i'm glad we mentioned the etcd session joy deep called out the 118 that was great there was all those sharp edges being shared there and so alex's findings go off to many different teams when he yes. talked about cgu the cluster group upgrade that's part of that talum tom operator i shared the topology where life cycle manager so mm -hmm. we definitely want to come back and talk about the global hub operator and the inspect tool for that and then the event driven architecture because these all go hand in hand because Alex is sharing a, you know, this is the CNF, the containerized network functions, you know, the journey from VNFs to CNFs of so virtualized network functions, you know, we're going to need mass scale as 5G RAN is deployed out across the globe. And 3500 is not going to cut it when you talk about those micro uh, cell sites and things, mm -hmm. you know, things in subways underground at a Super Bowl event. Uh, and, and so, that's where Joy Deep's working on the global hub and the architecture there and capacity planning, event driven. Just you can't like ACM has a GUI that goes along with the API and CLI and, and you're going to you're going to do these things. You're not going to paginate through that many number of clusters. Yeah. You're going to set up your desired state and then we're going to have some architecture changes over the top so that we can overcome those etcd limits and sharp edges. But yeah, Alex he the things he finds in the scale app touch many different teams you know it's assisted it's it, it's the tom operator etcd you name it and we even yeah. heard ray alan ray and and uh, william caban talking about some of those sharp edges like protocol improvements with etcd right so your mileage is going to vary these these are our red hat lab findings and in the last um open shift 414 what's new we have an entire slide on some of these uh, findings not related to the CNF workloads, right? So I encourage you to go out and look on the YouTube for the what's new, what's next. I'll, I'll post that link in the chat so you have it. But Alex, you could keep going. These are great, yep. these slides. Yeah, so the next uh, kind of performance issue, this is the only other one I have in the slides really. Um, I want to highlight, because this one is, this one's not an OOM. So this one, you know, you looked at the cluster when we encountered this and there was nothing OOMing. It's just, uh, this is an example of why why we have to scale test to 3,500. Because um, if we were to just scale test a subset only to 500, and then on occasion jump to 3,500, we'll we'll end up finding bugs like this later on. It'll be later in the development cycle, and it might not be able to get fixed before you know it might be a dot one fix then or something like that. So this is why we we strive to do this this uh, performance testing throughout the development cycle so that way we can keep the those developers can get the fix and we have a scalable we have a scalable version of the product from the day one that it ga's so uh in this example here um you'll see that well in prior runnings with 2.8 everything's fine um you can see we're getting up to 3500 managed clusters beyond 3500 uh they're all become a, Beyond 3,500 becoming DU compliant. Um, however, later on we test a newer build and then suddenly managed clusters is not keeping up. It's super obvious when you see this graph. Mm -hmm. However, if you, if you uh, let's say you kick this test late off at night and then you went to bed and then you woke up the next day and you said, oh, I have 3,500 managed clusters. Maybe you just happened to sleep long enough that they eventually may trickled their way in. But 
you know, because I have this graph that's produced through this, uh, this, this tool here, and it tells me what the output was, and I could see the output and then could see this graph, it's super obvious. Well, it seems like at around 16 to 1700 clusters, suddenly managed clusters isn't keeping up anymore. So we looked at the logs of the, the import controller, nothing was sticking out. So I, phoned that development team up, was like, hey, look, I've, I found this anomaly. There's nothing that's running out of memory. Um, you know, so we had to focus on figuring out which build, exact build this was introduced in. And it turned out it was actually like a, a an RBAC issue inside the code that they they added. So once they found that, they fixed Ooh. it. And um, let's see here. Boom, we're back to another uh, scalable uh, version again. So it was just, very interesting to see that we find sometimes we find issues that hey have an obvious problem you see a ceiling something's OLMing usually the OLM is related to that uh, but then there's there could be performance problems where it's inside the actual uh, you know in the code itself there uh, there's other examples of this although I have not put together slides for it for instance the policy engine uh, of a rather interesting one that we we just got solved in 2.9 was where if we trickled clusters in, um, so I have more than one version of this workload. Kind of Joey Deep had mentioned how I have um, multiple iterations or variations of this workload as well. This is just the 500 per hour. But what if I trickle things in? Um, I actually, personally, as a performance engineer, I kind of like that idea better because uh, each cluster is going to be kind of slowly at a different step rather than having this thundering herd of 500 all hitting mm -hmm. the same thing at the same time. Um, however, you know, I do understand that admins out there kind of administering or, or kicking off the build, they might want to, hey, I want to build this whole, uh, you know, this whole region with one go. I don't want to have to build part of the region, part of the, re you know, maybe that's what they have. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to be deploying these clusters. So we need to test both, hey, these thundering herds of 500, we need to test hey, let's trickle in 40 every five minutes. And the reason why I chose 40 every five minutes is that gets us really close to 500 per hour. It's actually 480 clusters per hour if you convert that into a clusters per hour made up metric. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we found like an issue where once we increase the policy count, um, that the policy engine was actually having more trouble with the trickle in workload versus the thundering herd workload. Well, the policy team spent a bunch of time they resolve that i've never seen uh like a, a flatter time as far as hey as scale goes up it's not taking longer to do what it what it what it needs to do so that's that's we always love to see that when we see something hey you run it at with 3000 or you run it with you know like whatever it took for the the easiest super one or two clusters it it's doing the same when i had the 3000th cluster that's great so and that's a good change with the adding adding like the incremental things in right because what's linear to us isn't linear to them you know like uh because different requirements for different customers right maybe they have security things or whatever right like especially if you work in really close environments like there's just certain things you have to have in place um so yeah that's man that's awesome this is awesome yep yeah so that's that's all i got on the slides to share um i i guess i would like to make the point too that you know at the conclusion of every one of these runs just a whole ton of data is collected on the cluster. Mm -hmm. um, and that assists me with, with hey, whenever I find, okay, now I need to, to, to look through, do the forensic side. I have classification scripts that automatically look at the failed clusters and decide, oh, this is this is the MCO bug that we've seen before. This is the etcd bug or something, or this is, uh, you know, this is an unknown bug now. This is something that's worth it to look into. Um, and then we also have the ACM inspector run at the end of it. And this is where we've tuned this type of testing to help with Joey Deep building capacity planning. So it's one thing for us to see capacity with, hey, everything's a single node open shift. When it's a single node open shift, there it's all gonna be basically the same, but we know that customers for ACM are also running lots of multi-node clusters. So I've conveniently run clusters or uh, iterations of the test for Joey Deep to analyze where I've ran like, hey, let me run 500 compact clusters, and then the next 500, however many compact clusters I could fit across my hypervisors that I have mm -hmm. available, 
and we're going to take measurements of resources, etcd measurements, all that, all that great knowledge that Joey Deep has related to uh, scaling and issues that he knows that ACM needs to have in that uh, that CSV file, so he could put it all together. So we'd run two iterations. Here's it with a single node object. Here's it with a compact cluster. So now we can see, hey, what what is different there? Uh, if I run a compact cluster, is you know, is it using more CPU or is it using more memory for uh, this component within Open Cluster Management, or is it something else that's consuming more? So that's where we've been able to discern those two things. So I, was, I, I gotta say, like, yeah. um, watch it, like going through the charts, dude. You just told an excellent story, right? And I mean, like, this this could not have been. I mean, it's some super nerd stuff, right? I'm not, I'm not even going to deny it at all. But like the way that you walk through and step through each one of these tests and like what it meant and how it correlates to the, you know, the thing before the thing after, like that was, that was on the money, man. Like that was, this is a great presentation. Yeah. He okay. always nails it. We does these for every release as we've, as Joy Deep said, this story started at a thousand to 2000 we incremented by 500, but like whether it was the stair analogy or when the line flattens out, you know, or, you know, something tailing off at the end, it, it is a phenomenal story. And the yeah. you know, picture says a thousand words and, Indeed. and yeah, Alex is, you know, and Alex we trust. And, and he just said, he just mentioned two scenarios. There are countless scenarios like that where, which had set from actually number 250 to 3,500, right? There are mm -hmm. common scenarios like this. And again, I'll say this This also helps us, Johnny, to uncomplicate that very complicated ACM black box. And we can see, hey, it is, to be honest, we actually know the model. Otherwise, we could never mm -hmm. debug it. But we are afraid to, not we are afraid, but, but, the, but the push to put it on software, to codify that model in software, those kind of models have not existed. Now right. they are coming, now they are getting pushed, you know, uh, industry is slowly moving towards that and Alex's, this stuff is awesome. And the other thing that, you know, that Alex said, I, I examined the deltas and things like that. Those are also the things that we are trying to see. Back to the point, Johnny, you were making, how can I differentiate between two different AC right. runs, right? Those are the things we are trying to nail it down. It's, it's, yeah. it's not very easy given the way the data differs, but hey, we should be able to find out a way. I love it. I, I think it's awesome. And like one thing that you just said that like it it really like the the nerd sense right really goes off. It's it's that it's it's complicated. It's hard, right? But we're taking on that challenge. We're the royal we really Alex and yep. Joy Deep and team. Uh, the the super nerds are taking on the challenge to make make that transparent to our users, right? Or our customers where right. they go in and they're like, oh man, it's just super easy. Check this out. And they go click a couple buttons and then they've got a graph and they've got the the stuff that they need, right? And yep. I think that's that to me is awesome, right? When we make the hard things easy instead of making the easy things hard, it's just that's I think that's where we give the most value, right? Right. right. That is You're data driven right. decision making. Data that's driven right. decision making is not throwing the kitchen sink at someone and go figure. I'll give yeah. you plenty of charts and I'll swim in them and go figure what's going on. And I will tell you what's going on. Yep. You nailed it, Johnny. Like in the total cost of ownership theme isn't just hardware and compute yes. cost. It's yes. admin hours. Get that. Yes. Get, man on the head. Get, get these yes. desired state and and let the automation, you know, let us run that automation. Let us do the heavy lifting. You you exactly said it right. And we'd love to come back to talk about some of those other things we briefly touched on, whether it was the global hub operator, which has its own capacity planning tool, because that's a the re-architecturing above the etcd limits. But even the mileage may vary, right? We heard in the Ad CD yeah. episode that there's some in, improvements around performance that, there around. I think it was the RAF protocol, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so, depending on what you're doing, in, and Alex to, uh, explained, you know, the GitOps rate was something we declared for a telco scenario workload. You may need more or less. So you're you're maybe going to get more mileage out of these things based on a, quite a few circumstances that are multidimensional, as as Joy Deep and Alex have reinforced here. Yeah. Yeah, we'd let, in other words, I'm requesting a slot in 2024 to come back and talk some more. You're always welcome back. You guys are always welcome. Like this, this I think is a, it's a great topic, especially for anybody that's done one or more OpenShift clusters, right? Like Joy, yeah. when you said it earlier, right? Like if, if you have one or two, okay, okay, maybe. But like once you start doing two, three plus, like now, now it's time, right? That you're taking out of your day, right? Or out of, out of your schedule and out of your team to go and make sure that everything's in sync, everything's the way it's supposed to be, all the governance things that you need to have in place are in right. place where you need a tool like ACM 
to do that multi-cluster management and to to actually apply that governance and give you that feedback right away where you know if you're out of sync or whatever like I, right yeah right. It, it's, Johnny, it's such an awesome tool and Johnny if I may and and yeah. then when you get to the telco scale when you get to the edge scale then you require the edge layer which which our um, which the talum as as Alex was mentioning mm -hmm. another layer of operator which uses ACM but which tells hey you want to deploy uh this policy or this set of policies across 1,000 cluster, you're not going to deploy all of them together. You're crazy to do that, to change 1,000 production cluster at a time, right? You want to yeah. group them. Talum handles that for you, just sitting a layer above, right? And likewise, ZTP, that's sitting a layer above ACM, using the ACM APIs, but if you have to configure eight CRs, roughly, uh, give or take, six CRs, mm -hmm. of uh, secrets and things like that, for each of the 3,000 clusters, it's going to be hard. We'll make it simple for you. We'll create a higher level API so that this kind of things becomes easier. There comes yeah. the ZTP layer, you know? So that's, yeah. that's the ecosystem as you grow bigger and bigger. That's yeah, awesome. that was, that's how this story comes together too. Like with um, adding things like Talum, that wasn't in the initial, you know, runs of a thousand and fifteen hundred. That came along the way because we realized the need. You can't just bundle everything in the ACM box. As a matter of fact, you know, we're trying to go in line. You know, you've, we've had folks on here talk about whether it's in this series or what's new, what's next, OpenShift Composable, you know, the a la carte. Mm -hmm. ACM, as we look to 2024, we'll be shrinking the cluster size, doing all these things to be able to go to a smaller footprint than single yeah. OpenShift. So, yep, coming to a theater soon. Some more there as we come back for performance and scale in 2024. Yeah. We look forward That's to That's awesome. That. That is awesome. Yeah, I, you guys are always welcome back. We, uh, Andrew and I, I know I wish Andrew was here, but uh, yeah. uh, this is something that we talk about all the time offline. Like it, it's it's really an awesome tool. And what, once you get digging in and you can you just see the capability, it's like <laughs> with all the things that you can do with it, which I think is just incredible. We feel the ACM love. I I think it's hard pressed to attend one of these series, ask an OpenShift admin series without you guys name dropping ACM. So we we really appreciate it, right? Yeah, and, man. And yeah, we, um, with that ACM two nine, I I dropped the support matrix in there. You can see the pillars we talked about here per feature, you know, and and uh, absolutely check it out. It was ACM two nine's releasing today. Thanks again. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And so I. You know, I know we're we're running way over right now, so um, I want to give you guys, you know, a chance to, you know, have any last comments or if you have anything else you want to talk about before we jump off. Oh last man, comment. I knew you were going to say something. Last yes. comment from my side. Alex, an honest test was running itcd on SSD, by the way, because this is this is hitting itcd hard. Yeah, uh, itcd is yep. performing wonderfully well, but we have to run it on SSDs. Yeah. yeah so so one of the, yeah one of the things we do with our testing is I, I think I alluded to it a little bit earlier we uh, I I want to find the problems in the software I don't want to run out of hardware mm -hmm. so you'll see me use the best machine that we can get out of out of the scale lab so I always I have like I have a lot of memory space and I could always I could just bump anything up more memory if it needs it it's just uh um, the point is we want to find where the software breaks not that Hey, I tried to go to 3000, but I just didn't have enough hardware to do it. Right. So, so I, I do have a question. You talked about it a little bit in what were you seeing on the CPU side? Was it like, was it scaling kind of, you know, as you would expect, just kind of like creeping up, like as the memory was being consumed more or did like, was CPU just well, basically like, depends whatever. on the workload. And it's okay. also, uh, yeah. So, I mean, obviously it depends on the workload. Right. Uh, that's the famous like performance engineer answer it depends um <laughs> yes <laughs> uh i mean i have graphs i could certainly share uh we have you know we have graphs from acm inspector i have mm -hmm. additional graphing tools that pull up cpu graphs um i i don't know that the the numbers off the top of my head but i'd have to pull up those graphs there yeah okay yeah, yeah another minute to put you on the spot i was just wondering because you're like generally in like vm world and stuff like that right it's you're going to see cpu and ram kind of like well ram's going to be just eaten alive but like cpu will will scope or uh not scope but kind of creep right as as you start to consume more uh, yeah, well, virtual machines so i was just i figured it's probably one of the trends the same. yeah one of the trends uh that we've seen is that like the all of the the pods components that i've looked at within like open cluster management as well as multi cluster engine mm -hmm. those two components they'll uh Throughout the provisioning, there'll be spikes, especially following the steps. Everything kind of yeah. follows the step pattern. You'll you'll find graphs and then, oh, memory jumped up, memory jumped up, memory jumped. You know, it's like 
they should all look the same. If they don't look the same, yeah. it's actually like, uh, what's going on there? Yeah. You know? exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you um, normalize the graphs over time, you will see that generally with, with 3,500, we are still very much in the linear range. Awesome. The, the Cube API server memory consumption sometimes uh, sometimes does not, you know, a couple of points fall outside the regression line, but I mm -hmm. think it's more due to nature of testing and things like that. Uh, but generally, we are still within the linear range. That and awesome. behavior while installing yeah. and behavior while it's running steady, they are different. Just as Alex told, you are adding 500, there's a jump and something. Adding, so that behavior is a little different from the steady state behavior. But we are still within the linear zone. That's one of the things we check. You know, the moment we find out that, hey, this is not linear anymore, then we know that we are going into a gray area. Right. Man, awesome. Yeah, so, Alex, I don't know if you want to, if, if you have any last words or, or Brad, if you all had any last words. and. No, I think I think, uh, I think we covered pretty much most of it. It's, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's always more to talk about. I have yeah. I have like probably 150 different graphs I could show right. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Want to get nerdy? Um, Let's get nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, the presentations always generate a lot of great dialogue, and and uh, so yeah, we're par for the scale course here. Awesome. Well, I. I Man, this has been an outstanding session for me. Like I've learned a ton from you guys. I really appreciate it. I, I hope that uh, our viewers, if if uh, if they weren't able to tune in live, that when they go back and watch it, uh, I hope that they were able to get a lot out of it. And with that said, um, if you are watching and you have questions, feel free to email me or uh, Brad's email is in the chat. Um, and yeah, you know, either way, or you can email Andrew as well, and we'll get your question. Uh, we'll get you. We'll, we'll get you squared away. Is what I'm trying to get to. Um, but yeah, don't don't be, don't worry about if if it's a dumb question or if you think it's a dumb question. Right? We like the easy ones sometimes too. Right? It's it, it makes us feel better because we can answer them quickly. So, uh, yeah. But make sure you ask. And yeah, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Um, this was really. I mean, I, I mean, like an excellent session. And we'd love to have you come back in 24. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Alex. Yeah, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Respect. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Click this button here if I can find it. Normally, Andrew does this, so like I'm, I'm looking like a bum right now. Yeah. All right, now for real, bye. <laughs> <laughs> At least only gets better.